वहिया गहुना Whatever happens on our journey, it starts right here and it starts today. Let's do it. It's just two brothers, two bikes, and a 14,000 kilometer road trip around India. Riding in India, baby. You just have to bring your A game every day for 60 days. Oh, careful. Ooh, this looks like a traffic jam. Oh my god. You should never run off a mountain. No, never. It's really raw and really colorful. Good morning. Humanity is just in your face. Every 100 kilometers, there's a different religion, a different language, a different challenge. Oh. Wow, it's absolutely beautiful. This is a real life adventure, unlike any other. Go, 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 go. Nothing but us, the road, and India. There's just so much going on. Okay, let's go. This is Tough Rides India. Colin and I are going to ride 14,000 kilometers around India. From Delhi, we head north over one of the highest and most dangerous roads in the world, the Rotong Pass. From there, we ride to the heavily militarized border of Pakistan and then south to bustling Mumbai. We ride along the sunny beaches of the southwest and then turn north to the ancient city of Madurai. Then it's north to taste the royal teas of Darjeeling and then down to Bodhi Gaya, the birthplace of Buddhism. Then it's along the Ganges to the Taj Mahal and then back to where it all started. There's traffic going both ways on both sides. It's really scary. On the entrance form, it did say that visitors have to enter at their own risk. Today was my favorite day so far. I was just really motivated at how little can make such a big difference. We were going through these beautiful green fields and farming communities, and then things got a lot worse. This little kid ran out in the middle of the road. I came inches away from ruining that kid's life. Day 43 of the India ride. We're on the road from Calcutta heading north up into the Mahabharat Mountains, or the Lesser Himalaya. Our destination is Darjeeling, the tea capital of India. Yesterday we were stuck in a huge traffic jam. It was 35 degrees Celsius and I was roasting. 24 hours later, I'm up in the mountains and it's 10 degrees Celsius and I'm really cold. We really wanted to have an easy day. We were slow and safe. And then with about 20 kilometers to go, I got a flat tire. And we didn't spend a whole lot of time trying to figure it out. We just rolled it back down the hill until we found a motorcycle mechanic. Okay, so this is our tire repairman. Let's see what he's got for us. Hello. Hello. What's your name? My name is Kalzang. Kalzang? Yeah, I'm a Buddhist. You're Buddhist? Yeah. Nice. Don't you like Buddhists? I do like Buddhists. What? No but. Will you go to Sikkim? Today I go to Darjeeling. Darjeeling, OK, then. But today, to, to get to Darjeeling, I need some help. OK, I will help you. Don't worry. OK. Holy. It's, it's a Land Rover. It's a people rover. Ah, people rover. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Is this the old one? What's wrong? Big nail. Big nail. Wow. Much bigger than last time. Awesome. Thank you for allowing to work on our bike before some of your other customers. I appreciate it. You yeah, appreciate me. That's great work. Thank you. Kelsing got the job done. He had it back up and on the bike all within an hour. And we rolled into Darjeeling with no real problem at all. This is the Darjeeling train station. Look at this little train track. The British built this when they were here. See these little the station signs? Yeah. They it's look like of, the London 2. Yeah, they're kind of London 2. It's cool. It actually looks pretty comfy inside. We 
can just look out and see the view a little bit. And this is what it is, just all mountains. And this is Darjeeling behind us, and it's quite stunning. After struggling for so long in the heat in southern India, it's nice to be back in northern India where things are a little bit cooler and more relaxed. This is the final stretch of our trip, and I'm excited to begin that final stretch. As amazing as India is, and as wonderful as you know the places that we're going to see on the way home, can't wait to start taking those first steps back towards Delhi and uh, and you know back towards my family. <laughs> Today we're visiting the Makabari Tea Estate, which has been making tea since 1859. It's one of the first professional tea estates in the world. We're getting a personal tour with the new CEO, Kaldip Basu, who gave up the London grind to manage this tea estate three years ago. This is quite a beautiful spot, actually. Thank you. That's primary rainforest over that side. There's primary rainforest below. So everything we're looking at basically is yeah. yours, like the Makabari. No, it's theirs. It, it belongs to the people who cultivate. Land has a, has a tendency of belonging to the person who takes care of the land. Of course. Yeah. So it belongs to the community. Yeah. You can't own a piece of land, put it's, it in your pocket and big. just yeah. Wa yeah, walk off somewhere. What's the criteria for being a tea plucker? Is it an age thing or is it a generational thing or do you take anyone and teach them? How would you find a good tea picker? We don't recruit good pluckers. We recruit people and then the pluckers sort of Come rise to the top. I've noticed they're all women. Yeah, they're all women, yeah. yeah. Plucking, it's to do with the fingers, it's to do with the patience, the passion. It's a lady's job. And would these pickers also live in the community? They live, they live in the community. Yeah. They, we have got seven villages. Okay. Uh, those seven villages are spread in different parts of the estate. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of our pluckers come from those seven villages. And they are, they've been living here for what, three, three, four generations. It's just incredible. I was blown away by the philosophy and what the company stood by. They have such a holistic approach about the village. You know, this tea estate owns an entire mountain on all sides. And so there's people that live around it and live on it. <laughs> They've created schools and hospitals and libraries for these people because to them, they own the tea estate just as much as the CEO, and it's just incredible. Now, this is the record holder, this is the jewel in our crown. It is unlike any black tea that you'll ever have. It's plucked only on full moon nights. Only on full, that's gotta be a lie. You can't say, <laughs> yeah, exactly. you can't say stuff like that. That's once a month. That is once a month. We get eight pluckings. I hardly make a thousand kilos of that no more. What happens in the full moon night is that the leaves, which would normally be asleep, sort of perk up a little bit. And that's the effect. That's why it remains silver and the other stuff doesn't. It's the same bush. Same genetics. It's to get those hairs on the thing to perk up so that it can be immediately brought, immediately put on the dryer and processed straight away so as not to let it go back to sleep again. So just that one moment. That's amazing. Wow. That's amazing, amazing. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> this is the real thing. In the Beijing Olympics, this was sold for 56,800 rupees a kilo. A kilo? 56,000 rupees a kilo. Yeah. That's, that's more expensive than, you know, drugs. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And some people so, consider so this, some people <laughs> consider this drugs. I got my own Makabari silver tips, baby. The highlight of the entire trip. <laughs> It's very exciting today because today we really start our journey back to Delhi, the final leg of our trip. We've been here a really long time. We've uh, struggled much, but we've also seen much, and it's been an incredibly rewarding process. Yeah. And as you can tell from our healthy beards and the quaff, the, the, quaff, the stunning hair, that, uh, that we've enjoyed our time. Yeah. I'm ready to go to Delhi. Eight days, hopefully. Eight days. We're on the road to the holy city of Bodhi Gaya, home to the Mahabodhi Temple, the place where Buddha was enlightened. And then it's onwards for a dip in the Ganges River at Varanasi, and then a compulsory stop at the Taj Mahal, 
before the final home stretch to Delhi. Everyone on this trip said we shouldn't come through Bihar because it's really like the wild west of India. There's a lot of robberies and it's a bit dangerous on the roads. He's just walking with a gun. But we needed to come through Bihar. It's on our way, so we're doing this at our own risk. Whatever happens, kind of happens. We're just rolling along the Ganges River and we've just been rolling through village after village and town after town. There's so many people. It's just, it's humanity. Every part of humanity is just in your face. And it's really raw and really colorful. Today, we're visiting the place where Buddha came when he was first enlightened and decided to share his, you know, version of thinking uh, with the wider world. I think very, so. It's quite very exciting. Confused about this, actually. I can't wait to ask our guide some questions. Welcome to the Mahabodhi Temple. Okay. Maha and Bodhi are two different words, which means the great enlightened. Great enlightenment. Yeah. So, Colin and I need some enlightenment. Yeah. Oh, you want to get enlightenment? Yeah. So you must go to the caves or forest yeah. and do meditation for a while. Okay. The, look at all the intricacies. Next. Now we're going to see the Bodhi tree. Okay. Bodhi and tree. the Buddhism arose from this place. From this tree? From this tree. Okay. That's where Buddha got enlightenment in the first week. Buddha spent the first week over here. Six twenty-three BC. Yes, in the sixth century BC. Prince Siddhartha attained Buddhahood. Buddhahood means enlightenment. enlightenment. See that square thing over there? Mm -hmm. That whole thing is called Vajrasana. Vajrasana means the place of enlightenment. Okay. And this is the tree where Buddha sat. Wow. The place and the tree. So, so it's with, first without this tree. Yeah. And without Prince Siddhartha yeah. sitting there, yeah. there would be no Buddhism. No Buddhism existing for but. There must be like a billion people in the world that are Buddhist. Of course, you're right. Buddha is one of the great teachers. That's what we've learned today. He became enlightened by sitting under this beautiful tree. And then after he became enlightened, he visited several different places inside the Mahabodhi temple area. And then over the years, people have followed him, wrote down scriptures. Now people flood the Mahabodhi temple to learn more about Buddha. This is the place called Raja Yatana. At this place, Buddha has spent the seventh week. Why, why seven weeks, out of curiosity? Why not why eight not weeks? Or why ten not ten weeks? weeks? Uh, because after seven weeks, he decided to move from this place and he went to Saranath, where he gave the first sermon to his five disciples and other people. And then they, then they, they gave this sermon to five other people, and then they gave it to five other people, and now you've got like a billion people That's right. following the Buddhist faith. Yes, yes. We're on day 48 of our India ride. It's quite interesting. That yeah, so to stumble upon this. Yes. Yeah, we're almost on our seven, seven weeks. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, goodness. So after our seventh week, we leave India, and we share our journey of India. Yes, yes, with yes, the yes, yes, yes. very good, very good. Hopefully more than five people. You know, I'm not very religious. I don't agree with everything. I think some of it is a little far-fetched and, and some of it's more of a story. Buddha has spent the sixth week in meditation. Suddenly, a very big storm came. So a cobra protected Buddha from the rain and thunder. Do I believe that it's word for word? Of course not. But I think Buddhism is very interesting. It's less about the rules that you need to live by and more about enlightening yourself and self-awareness to be a better person, to understand the world around you through yourself and meditation. This is built by King Ashoka. People now, they just put their coin up, and if the coin be there on the top, then it says lucky. Ready? It should be on the middle. The, yeah, the very right top. top. Right at the top. Lucky now. Lucky, you are, you are enlightened. Yeah, you are enlightened. You are enlightened. That's right. People have been just trying maybe 20 or 30 or 50 or 60 times. Yeah. I can't believe Very you lucky. did that. <laughs> For sure. 
It's been a really enlightening day, Nadim. Thank you so much for your you're excellent most, tour. You're most welcome, sir. We really, uh, really enjoyed that. I think we really learned a lot. You know, we've been to a, a Sikh temple yeah. and a Hindu temple, yeah. and now we've been to a Buddhist temple. Yeah. Awesome. That's very nice. Yeah. <laughs> this afternoon, we had a different experience. Since the beginning of this trip, Colin's been joking that I've been kind of stressed out, and he was always joking that I could use some meditation training. Very nice to meet you, Colin. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Ryan. The gentleman today who showed us around, he was a big CEO for a company in New York, and his regular route would have taken his plane into the World Trade Center. 9-11, he would have died, but for whatever reason, he got pulled to Houston that day. And the next day, he actually quit his job and wanted to discover why he was chosen to live concentrate only on the breath and not allow any thoughts to come, not think of anything else, thoughtless state. Just be aware of your breath. We'll try. Try? OK. I tried to focus on my breathing, and then I could feel, I could feel like uh, my mind try to wander, yeah. and I, it's like I had to push it away and then come back to the breathing, yeah. and then something else would come. Being yourself and being aware of that is meditation. Observe your sensations within your body. If you can understand that, you have understood the universe. Bodhi guy is done, and day 48 of the India ride is done. We only have five days left. Our trip is really coming to an end. From the home of Buddhism, we're heading to another holy place, Varanasi, on the banks of the Ganges River. And then it's onwards to one of the wonders of the ancient world, the Taj Mahal. Today's day 50 of the India ride and we're here in Varanasi. It's a holy place for both Buddhists and Hindu people. We've heard so much about how it's the cultural center of India and an ancient historic city that's built along the Ganges River. Then we wanted to see what Varanasi had to offer. Varanasi is the oldest and most holy city in India, often called the world's oldest living city. Hindus believe that death and cremation here bring salvation. I just love how all the buildings are built right up on the, on the water. This is a very medieval town. Yeah, it is. feel uh, the history along the river. When you swim in the Ganges here, this is where the body and the soul become one. And I think that's also part of why it's such a holy place for people to be buried. There's been a few funerals that have happened this morning where they burn the bodies and then put the ashes in the river. Is it a Hindu thing for burning the bodies? It's a Hindu thing, and also this town is a holy town for Buddhists. Buddhist. And someone was mentioning earlier that there's also a sizable Muslim population here. Hello. Hello. How are you? How are you? People are bathing, brushing their teeth, and burning their loved ones who have passed away all within 100 meters of each other. It's interesting. If we went in that water right now with our immune systems the way they are, we would think fail. Your yeah, <laughs> Dan... body would be like, what the? I don't think this part of the Ganges works for me. I'll give you that. It's like swimming in the Thames at home. I don't think I'd do that either. Just by sitting on this boat ride and looking back into some of these ghats and some of these riverfront areas, you'd be able to spend a week here just exploring what's along the river. I feel like I would have liked to have visited here uh, when I was fresher. Some energy? Yeah, you know, one of the big problems with these long trips that we do is your body just starts to fall apart. No matter how fit you are or how healthy you are when you come into this, 50 days on the road, moving every day. No, I agree. And, and you know, I'm coming down with a bit of a cold now. I can feel it. Your body just, you know, it just senses that you're almost over and it just wants to give up. But you just got to push it a few more days and, and get through. Yeah. Thank you, sir.
reality is at the end of the trip, your body is completely worn, your mind is worn, and it's tough to sort of stop and smell the roses. You just take every ounce of you to get through the day. Don't think about the end until it happens. And then, all of a sudden, you're in Agra, only 200 kilometers from Delhi, one day's ride from home. We caught a glimpse of the Taj Mahal on our way in, and it looked incredible. We finally made it to our last stop. Wow. Amazing. First sights. I had no idea it was so big. No idea it was so beautiful. You see pictures of it, but it just doesn't do it justice. We've traveled over 11,000 kilometers so far in India. We've been on the road for now 53 days. And I don't know about you, but I've been really building up this idea of getting to the Taj and this kind of being the last great thing we were gonna really see on this journey. Yeah, it's really lived up to it. Man, it's, it's just gorgeous. It's, it is. It's, I'm speechless. I remember our first night in Shimla, how it was just terrible. And uh, <laughs> it was a really long day, and it was yeah. just a horrible night. Yeah. And I remember thinking, man, we have a long way to go until the Taj Mahal. Yeah. The you Taj know, has always been the end point. It has. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at that point, I was like, how are we going to do this? Like, the first day was so hard, and this is such a, a terrible hotel we stayed at. And you're just just thinking of the Taj, and then, and then you know, here we are. Here we are. And it's pretty cool. 53 days later. No matter how difficult things seem at the beginning, if you just take little steps along the way, and you'd be amazed at what you can accomplish. You know, the Taj Mahal has built 20,000 people. It took 22 years building that. Obviously much more intense than just a 50-day trip, but it's what you can accomplish if you just sort of take it day by day. On the road in India. <laughs> India is incredibly diverse from east to west and north to south, not only in religion, not only in dialect, not only in cuisine, but also in landscapes, in weather. We had the privilege of traveling through all those regions. Every 50 kilometers, it's a different place. It's so exciting and so interesting. At the same time, it's just so exhausting. I quit. <laughs> not every part's been fun. Not every part's been great. There have been some huge highs on this trip and some very low lows. When you travel by motorcycle, you feel every kilometer, you smell all the smells, you feel every change of weather, and it really puts you in the environment of the people and the communities that you're traveling through. We set out to see the places in between, and I think we really accomplished that. And I think I've seen a lot of real India. I've learned a lot about how little people can actually live on and still be content and happy. Fifty-three days of insane roads, over 11,000 kilometers. And on this, our last day in India, we get this gorgeous six-lane expressway, and they allow motorcycles. We've paid our toll, we have our little ticket, and we're ready to rock and roll. I cannot believe it. What a great way to finish. That deserves a fist bump. Oh, India. Yeah. Before day. Before day. Oh I love you, India, but I'm happy that it's over. Oh. How do you feel? It's awesome, man. Spent, shattered. Yeah. This is where it's at. Chad Ingram, you've been brilliant. It's been a pleasure, guys. Dan. Dan. You too, sir. Thank you. Fantastic. Shall we do a victory lap of India? Of India, or just uh, around the bike? No, I think victory lap of India. Just one more time. Let's just call it a day. Let's just call it a day. I'm out of here.